Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem, has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing there. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you. For they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of this, of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbour to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Thank you for your welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to share God's word this evening. Please keep your Bibles open at Zechariah chapter 3. I'm going to pray and ask God to help us as we look at his word together. Shall we pray? We thank you, Lord, that it is in Christ alone that we stand, took on flesh in order that he might die upon the cross, bearing in his own body the wrath of God for our sins. Only he, God and man, could do this. God, that he would bear it, and man, that he could die. We thank you for it, Lord. We rejoice in our Savior tonight, and it's in his name that we gather to hear the word that you've inspired. May we see wonderful things from your law. May we learn truth about your Son, our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we pray it in his worthy name. Amen. Have you ever felt that you've let God down? Ever felt you've messed up and it's just too much? Once too often, maybe. Or this time, it was worse than the times before. Well, guilt is a real problem. And this passage tonight is all about guilt and how to deal with it. I am reminded of the Liverpool preacher who is preaching on thou shalt not steal. And as he looked from his text, there was someone in the audience and he had his book at home. He didn't feel uh, very good at that start, at that uh, stage in the message, but I think he made up for it later on. But this message is relevant for all who felt the burden of their sin and the problem of their guilt. To give you a little bit of background, um, Zechariah is one of what's called the latter prophets. There's three at the end of the Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And they are different from the former prophets. How are they different? Well, you see, the former prophets prophesied and spoke God's word to the people, but sin got so bad, and it really did. They were burning their children in the flames to false gods. 
They defile the temple. They had an idol in the temple. There was adultery. There was violence. There was wickedness of all sorts that God said, enough's enough. And the people were taken captive to Babylon for 70 long years. And then they came back wonderfully, miraculously. God moved a heathen ruler called Cyrus to send them back. And we're now some years on from that. Cyrus sent them back to build a temple. But the work had stalled. And the building project wasn't going well. So what did God do? He sent two men, one called Haggai, one called Zechariah, and they preached. Now, we wouldn't do that, would we? We'd think in terms of sending a builder, a gang of men, or whatever it was. God sent his word, and it was through his word that wonderful things happened. We have their story in Haggai and Zechariah. Now, Zechariah's message is one of those parts in the Bible that is given in vision. What do I mean by a vision? Well, he was, it was at night. Like a dream, but it's more than that. It's a vision from God. It's a revelation from God to this man. He has eight visions in one night. And they're all to give this message of encouragement to the people who are on the floor. Discouraged, disheartened, and unfocused. We're into vision number four. It's right at the heart of the eight. And it gets to the heart of the problem that the people were facing. Do you know what the heart of the problem the people were facing? It was sin. And at the end of the day, sin is the problem, isn't it? Before we're Christians, it's the problem that will take us to hell. Unless we repent and trust in Christ as our saviour, in Christ alone, as we have sung, but also after we become Christians, sin can sometimes be the problem that we face and need to deal with. That's our introduction to our passage this evening. And the question is this, the problem is this, the people knew that they'd done really bad things, and they also knew that since they'd come back, they hadn't got on with the job of building the temple. And right at the heart of it was this. Can God forgive us for what we've done? And how can he forgive us for what we've done? So God sends the vision. And here it is, the vision of Joshua, the high priest. And it's a courtroom scene. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord, this is an angel who speaks as God. Okay? So think of God. It's the angel of the Lord is the angel. Some people believe it was, in fact, Jesus before he come to earth and born as a baby. The angel of the Lord, a divine character. And before him stands, and he's the judge. And before him, you've got Joshua, who's the high priest, one of the two leaders in Israel who are key men. Zerubbabel is the governor, the ruler. Joshua is the high priest. And on the right hand of Joshua, Satan, man's greatest enemy. And Satan is accusing Joshua of sin. And Joshua does not speak in this vision. Why? Because he knows it's true. Satan is a liar. But when it comes to our sins, he speaks that he doesn't have to tell any lies. He just tells the truth about us. And it's damning. That's the situation. Satan is accusing Joshua. And Joshua has nothing to say. Now you may say, well, is this Joshua? No, it's, it's more than that. The high priest was the representative of the whole nation. It's a bit like 
you might say, uh, Prince Charles or a representative or, of a people. It's not just that Joshua has been bad, it's that the whole nation has been bad and he is representing before God and he is guilty. How is that shown? It says there, Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. He's clothed in the garments representing sinfulness. The sins of the nation. He's clothed in the garments of sin. Now, you know your Old Testament. You know that the high priest was meant to have tremendous garments on. Garments of glory and beauty, very special garments. And he went into the Holy of Holies once per year in these wonderful garments and a turban on his head. And he appeared before God. And here, he's clothed in filthy garments. He is not fit to go into the presence of God and minister as the high priest. So the point is this, even if they build a temple, what goods of a priest like that? He can't do it. That's the situation. It's not going well for him. And of course, Joshua's problem, the problem he faced, is the problem we all face. The problem of sin. And it's not just what we do, it's what we are. We remember that when in the very beginning, book of Genesis, when Adam fell, it wasn't just that he started doing bad things, it was that his nature was corrupted. And that's man's problem today. Not just one or two things here and there or even elsewhere that we do, but our very nature is is sinful. We have a sinful and a fallen nature. That's the problem Joshua faced on behalf of the people. That's the problem we face. And maybe there's someone here tonight and you know that you've never received forgiveness from your sins. That is your state before God. You are condemned. But the solution he found comes next. The problem he faced. The solution he found, amazingly, the angel of the Lord, who speaks as the Lord speaks. The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a, br a brand plucked from the fire? It's the angel of the Lord who comes to the rescue and he announces a rebuke to Satan and Satan is silenced. Accusation over. Now, if you are in a court and the judge rules in your favor, that's the end of the case. The judge has the power, innocent, to pronounce you innocent, and it's game over. The accuser has nothing more to say, and this is the great message. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's what it's teaching. If God is for his people, represented by Joshua, whatever Satan says will not stick. And that's true of, for you tonight and for me. If you're one of his people, joined to him by faith in Christ alone, if God is for you, who can be against you? He who spared not his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us all things? If God has given his best for us, and he is, and he has, and he is for us, Satan has nothing to say, nowhere to go, no accusation to bring. The problem Joshua faced was sin. The solution he found was righteousness declared from the judge himself. Verse 4. The angel says to those who are standing by, 
So this is Zechariah seeing this, a courtroom scene, angel, Joshua, Satan. And now the judge, the angel says, take away the filthy garments from him. It is something that is done to Joshua. <laughs> he doesn't do it himself. It is something that is done to him. And the angel commands that they take away the filthy garments which represent sin. And the point is this. There is cleansing for sins of the worst sort, but not something we can do for ourselves. It's something that must be done for us. Take away the filthy garments from him. And they do. And then he does something else. It's not that he just got sort of a clean t-shirt and uh, he was able to go. No, no. He now gets reinstated with rich robes. Remove the filthy garments from him, stage one. And he said, behold, I've taken your iniquity away from you. And I will clothe you with rich robes. Pure vestments here in this translation. I don't know if you remember the story of the prodigal son went away from his father, blew all the money, sinful, wicked lifestyle, ends up feeding the pigs, comes back. Father runs out to meet him, falls on his neck, gives him a kiss, bring out the best garments. Not just the garments, the best garments best that can be found and the position of the believer tonight before the Lord Jesus Christ is this we have the best that can be done for us he's not only taken away our sins but he's given us the best of the garments and put them upon us as we believe in Christ isn't that a tremendous thought as you gather around the communion table tonight if you're a believer all of your sins have been laid upon Christ and we see him on the cross covered with the shame and suffering that's due to us. But it's not only that, is it? It's all of his righteousness, all of his goodness, all of his person clothes us. And we have the righteousness of God himself given to us. We're clothed with the best robes. That's the picture here. And then at that point in the, in the vision, verse 5, Zechariah speaks. I don't know if you've ever been in a dream and suddenly you're part of the dream. <laughs> and you speak. So you're not just, he's a spectator up until this point. Now he speaks. And he says, put a turban on his head. Why does he say that? The turban was a sign of his reinstatement as the high priest. And Zechariah, the prophet who's watching this, is key not just that um, the filthy garment should be taken away and new garments should be put on, but that he should be reinstated as a priest with the priestly turban on. You see, Zechariah, he's a prophet, but he's not a priest. He needs a high priest, and he wants one, and he speaks up. Put a turban on his head, and it's done. A clean turban. The solution that Joshua found is the solution that we find through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a cleansing from every sin of the worst sort, filthy garments taken away, and clean, righteous robes put on, and a reinstatement to service. That's what happened in the next passage, because... The angel of the Lord gives him a command to obey. Verse 6. The angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, keep my commands, then you will rule in my house and you will have charge of my courts. These are the tabernacle, the temple. And you will have right of access among those who are standing here right of access to heaven that's what's happening 
In other words, I'm going to deal with your sin. I'm going to take it away. I'm going to give you righteousness that's perfect. And I'm going to allow you access to the very courts of heaven. But you must, he says, walk in my ways and keep my commands. Joshua was not being cleansed and reinstated to continue in his sin. But he's saved in order for holiness and a holy life. And for us who've been saved tonight, we're not saved to go back to our sins. We're really not. We're saved to lead a holy and a clean life before God in this world. And of course, for those who taste the grace of God and go back to their sins, have you heard of the phrase dead man walking? That's what you are. If you go back to your sin and walk out on Christ, there is no other sacrifice for sin. So we are saved. And we are given a righteousness that's from God himself. But we are to walk in his ways and keep his commands. That's the uh, command that he received. The problem he faced was sin. The solution he found was righteousness through faith. And the command he received, walk in uh, holy ways. But if there was a attorney in the courtroom he might raise an objection you've all seen that on the tv series haven't you i object well there's an objection that can be made here and it's this this is not fair this is not just he's a guilty man and you've just pronounced him innocent and you've not only pronounced him innocent you've given him the best robes and a turban and given him access to What's going on here? This is not right. And you know what? You might be right. But you see, we're not talking of justice at this point. We're talking of grace. Amazing grace. We're going to sing that pretty soon. And then the text goes on to explain how the angel, who is the Lord, can do this how can God do this how can due process be carried out how can justice be satisfied and of course there's another person introduced into the text let me read it here now Joshua the high priest verse 8 you and your friends who sit before you for they are men who are a sign behold I will bring my servant the branch. He is the one who's going to bring this about. For behold, the st on the stone that I've set before Joshua, a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its description, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in one day. And what happens then? It's a reference to this person called the branch who's going to come and in one single day he's going to remove the iniquity of the land, of all the people. And of course we're told in the New Testament who that branch is. Why is he called a branch? Well, because he's come from the tree of David. He's a son of David. He's out of the Davidic tree. And he comes in, and that was a title that they applied to Jesus. And of course, on the day that we call Good Friday, the sky was dark. And there was God placed on him the sins of us all. In one day, our sins were paid for by the man called the branch that's how God could pronounce Joshua forgiven, sins cleansed, because of Jesus, the branch, who was going to come and pay on the cross. Do you see this, friends? I don't know if I've jumped justice to the explanation, but that is what the text 
is saying. He, Jesus, in one day, and we get that phrase again and again in the book of Zechariah, in that day, I'll open a fountain for sin and uncleanness. In that day, I will pay for your sin. And finally, in verse 10, <clears throat> in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. What's that about? Well, it's peace, prosperity, and fellowship, and inviting our neighbors to join in. When we're forgiven by the Lord, for our sins, when our guilt is taken away, when we're saved and we know it, we want to have fellowship. We want to invite others. We want to enjoy the blessings of heaven with others. It's too good to keep to ourselves. So lessons. Number one, sin is serious and brings God's judgment Sin was Joshua's problem and sin was our prob is our problem. You know it, God knows it, Satan knows it. Am I talking to someone tonight whose sins are not yet forgiven? This is a passage very specially for you. But God is for his people. He has chosen. He says, I've chosen Jerusalem. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. I've chosen these people. I've plucked them out of the fire, like a, a burning fire. That's what they're in. They deserve it, but I've put my hand in, and I've saved them. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. And iniquity removed, righteousness provided, reinstatement effected, all through the work of the one whose death paid for sin on the cross on that one day of which this passage and this prophet makes reference 570 years before it, sorry, 550 years before it happened. How to make it yours? Repent. And believe the gospel. And that is it. How to make it yours? Repent and believe the gospel. These are the lessons from Zechariah chapter 3. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great truths that are set before us in your word. We thank you for your amazing grace, which is undeserved. We thank you for your limitless love. We thank you for your almighty power. And we thank you that Satan now has nothing to say against the believer. Because your son, on that day, paid it all upon the cross. For us. Help us, Lord, to see it. Help us, Lord, to believe it. Help us, Lord, to embrace.